Okay, so in this video, we're going to take a look at how lightning works, and we're going to use some key things from electric fields and electricity to try and explain that. Okay, so before we start, I just want to do a key a recap of some of the key things we've met so far that we're going to be using. So let's start off with some electric fields. So what I'd like to do is pause this video and in your additional notes section of your booklets, give yourself a title of um, lightning. And I'd like you to try and draw these four things. So a positive and the field around a positive and negative point charge, the field between two charge plates and the field around a conducting sphere. So pause the video now, have a crack at doing that. Once you've done that as best you can, uh, continue this video and then you can see what it should look like. Okay, so um, now you've had a chance to draw them. Here are the four things we should have. So with a positive point charge, we should see these lines going off what we described this as radially, and they're radially outward. On the negative charge, you should see the lines coming radially inward, like this. Between charged plates, you should see the lines going from positive to negative, and they should be equally spaced. Don't worry if yours are a bit further apart or a bit closer than mine are, as long as they're equally spaced going from positive to negative, that's absolutely fine. And then finally, our conducting sphere. So I've made mine a negatively charged conducting sphere. Uh, so you can see that the uh, lines go towards the conducting sphere, whether they're outside or whether they're inside. If you made your conducting sphere positive, your lines would be in the opposite direction, so they would be coming in. Uh, they'll be going away from it, both inside and outside. So it doesn't matter what charge you made your conducting sphere, um, it should look something a little bit like this. Okay, so second thing to take a look at, we have met two electricity concepts. So again, in your additional notes sections, have a go at defining current and potential difference. So pause the video now, have a crack at doing that. Let's see how you do. Okay, so now you've done that, let's see what we should have. So uh, current is the rate of flow of charge. Uh, often this is expressed in the form of this equation. So this equation is just restating um, what this definition is. So remember, a charge should be measured in coulombs. Time would be measured in seconds and current would be measured in amps. So we could have easily said the number of coulombs per second passing through a point. That's a perfectly valid definition of current. Likewise, potential difference, the energy transferred by a unit charge or a unit of charge. Um, so again, we haven't met this before, but this can often be expressed in an equation. So we've got our energy transferred per unit of charge, so per coulomb of charge, and then obviously potential difference we measure in volts. Things you haven't met that before, we might want to add that to our equation section of our booklets. So we got it to refer back to later on. OK, so let's dig into our um, lightning. So what does a lightning storm actually look like from an electricity perspective? Uh, so the first thing I'd like you to note down about it, you can see it in bold. Essentially, a lightning strike starts with charge separating inside a cloud. So you can see here in this cloud, we've got uh, some negative charge in the middle. It's positively charged at the top. And then at the bottom, it's sort of a mixture of positive and negative charge. And the next thing uh, it's key to write down is, so this process forms electric fields between the regions of charge. So we could start drawing lots of field lines onto this diagram showing all of these electric fields. So those are the two key ideas. We've got charge separating, we've got induction, if we would like to call it that. And that process is creating lots of electric fields. So overall, this cloud is still neutral, but we have essentially separated out the charge. This is why we call it induction. And this is why we get lots of lightning between clouds. So you can see this diagram is showing on here lightning bolts going between these clouds. Uh, lightning bolts in clouds are far more common than they are with the ground for reasons we'll discuss a little bit later on. Okay, So that's the key idea. We've separated charge in a cloud and created electric field. So what we're going to do is we're going to simplify um, what I'd like to do is just give you, uh, sketch yourself this diagram for a very simple model. So this whole top section is where the cloud is. And I've simplified it, so I've made the top of the cloud positive and the bottom of the cloud is negative. But the amount of charge cancels each other out, so the cloud is neutral overall. The ground is also fairly neutral. So sketch this diagram, and then what I'd like you to add onto it are your field lines to show what the field will look like 
both in the cloud and on the ground. So pause the video, sketch a diagram and have a go at that. And then once you've done that, describe to me what your field lines are showing. OK, so now you've had a chance to have a go at that. Let's have a look at what we should have. So this is what the field should look like. Um, so um, you wouldn't have known this, but this is something we should show here is um, the field lines in the cloud should be closer together than the field lines between the cloud and the ground. That's because the electric field is stronger inside the cloud than it is between the cloud and the ground. That's why we get far more lightning strikes occurring between clouds and inside clouds than we do with the ground. In terms of describing what they show, so the field lines indicate the direction a positive charge experiences an electric force. So if we plonked a positive charge here, we can see it'd be repelled by the uh, that positive charge. It would be attracted by the negative. That's why we've done the field line in that direction. The fact that they're equally spaced tells us that if we put a charge somewhere else, so let's say I put a force down here, a charge down here, it would experience the same force as that other one. It doesn't matter where we put it in that field. So in this whole top section, wherever we put a positive charge, it'll experience the same force. Same way in the bottom one, wherever we put a positive charge, it would experience the same force. But in the different fields, they'd experience different size forces. So the bottom one, there'd be a smaller force, the top one, there'd be a bigger force. So that's what our diagram is showing there. Uh, so let's add that down if you didn't get any of those parts. OK, so let's then move this on and look at what happens to have a lightning strike. So we're now going to change from looking at it in terms of an electric field to start to think about it in terms of a circuit. So if we connected a voltmeter between the cloud bottom and the ground, obviously we can't connect a voltmeter to to a cloud, uh, but if we could, we'd be measuring a potential difference because we've bunched up a lot of negative charges here. Um, so we have forced negative charges closer together. So we've created region of high electric potential energy. The ground doesn't have any of that, so it's neutral. So if we measured, put a voltmeter between the two, we'd measure a potential difference. Okay, so that's the first code here. We've got a potential difference between the ground and the cloud. So what that means is we if we can get some charge carriers between the two, we have the potential for forming a circuit. OK, so that's the key idea here. OK. What decides how strong the field? So this is where we can link back into our material on electric fields. So the bigger the potential difference gets, so essentially, essentially the bigger this V gets, the stronger the field gets. So this symbol E stands for the strength of the field. So bigger the potential difference, so the more charge that builds up, the bigger the potential difference, the stronger this electric field gets. And we'd show that by drawing lines closer and closer together if we were drawing a diagram. And eventually what happens is this electric field gets strong enough to ionize air. So it literally pulls electrons out of atoms in the air and forms ions. And what that means is we form a conducting pathway to ground, which means we get a lightning strike. So a lightning strike in your head, what I want you to think about is that's current because we've got a potential difference. We've got charge carriers now because we've ionized the air. Now we can have a current, which is what a lightning strike effectively is. OK, so that's um, the idea there. So what we're going to do is actually put this into some, some specific practice now. What I'd like you to do, uh, you might want to write down this question so when you refer back to this later on, you know what you're doing. So I'd like you to pause this video and have a crack at figuring out the time which the lightning strike takes and the potential difference between the cloud and the ground. Uh, we've looked at some equations earlier that you might find helpful here. So you've been given the current, the charge, and the energy. Uh, just pay attention to the uh, prefixes on here. So pause the video now, have a crack. OK, so now you've had a chance to have a go at those. Let's look at how we'd solve these questions. So in terms of calculating the time over which lightning strike occurs, we've been given current or I and we've been given charge Q. So this equation here will allow us to figure out what the time it took for the lightning strike is. So let's rearrange it. We can plug our numbers into this. So we've got a charge of 15 coulombs. Our current is 30,000 because it's kiloamps and therefore we get it's a potentially 0.5 milliseconds or 5 times 10 to the minus 4 seconds. 
In terms of calculating the potential difference between the cloud and the ground, we've got Q and we've got E, so therefore we can use this equation to calculate what the potential difference is. So again, we can um, rearrange our equation, we can substitute in our numbers, remembering that we've got gigajoules, giga gives us the 10 to the power of 9, and we've got the charge, 15 again, so you can see we get 6.7 times 10 to the 7 there. So a second practice question to have a go at. Again, let's just quickly write this down so you can refer back to it later on. Um, I will suggest you now pause it, have a crack, and then we'll see what the answers should be. Okay, so if we look at the information we've given, we've been given a time in here. We've been given Q, and I know that because I'm looking at its unit here. Note, we've got milliseconds in here. And we've clearly got a potential difference, again, with a prefix we should be aware of. So in terms of calculating, that should be fairly easy. We can do charge divided by time. We've got the charge. We've got the time. Remember, it's in milliseconds, which is why we've got time sent to minus three. And we get a current of 60,000 amps, so about double the current in the previous lightning strike. So different lightning strikes have slightly different currents, different amounts of energy. Um, it varies depending on the condition. Okay, so that's our current, and we want the lightning average power. Uh, so we haven't, I haven't given you this equation in this video, but we have met this before. We should know that power is current times potential difference. We've now got what the current is. We were given in the question what the potential difference was. We need to remember that we've got megavolts, which is why we've got times 10 to the 6. And we calculate that 7.2 times 10 to the 12 watts which we might write as 7.2 terawatts, tera being the prefix for times 10 to the 12. Okay, so now we're gonna look at um, some sort of conventional wisdom which you may have heard. So you may know that when there's a lightning storm, you should go in, if you're stuck out in the open, you should actually go to the center of the field or whatever you're in. You should definitely not hang out near trees. So we're going to try and explain that in terms of electricity concepts. And what I mean by that is talking about potential difference, current, resistance, those kind of things. So again, pause this video, have a crack. How would you explain why lightning would strike a tree and not just go straight to the ground. How can we explain that? Okay, so now you've had a chance to have a go and think about that. Let's have a look at how I'd explain it. And I'm going to redraw this diagram. So the way I'm going to think about this is um, like a diagram like this. So whichever way it's going to get to ground, the current has to go through some air. So that's what I've modelled up here. When it gets to the tree, it either could continue through the air, which has a really, really big resistance. So let's show that as a really big resistance. Or it could go through a tree, which has much, much lower resistance. And with your knowledge about um, circuits, you should know that current, if it's significantly smaller, is going to go this way. Uh, a very big current is going to go this way, and only a very small current is going to go that way. So the way we would explain this is because the tree has significantly lower resistance than the equivalent distance of air, um, we're going to get a much larger current flowing through the tree, which is why we shouldn't stand under the tree, because if we stand next to the tree, we could have that current going through us, because we're even lower resistance than the tree is, um, usually speaking, if we measure it. So um, that's why we shouldn't stand under a tree, because that we're providing a very low resistance pathway, which the current will definitely take. Okay, so that's why we don't stand under trees. A second question to have a think and have a crack at ex explain in terms of electricity concepts, again, potential difference, current resistance, why tall buildings have a lightning rod. And in just to quickly explain what that is, if we draw in on our diagram, uh, let's say we've got Big Ben here. It will have a metal wire that runs down the side of the building straight into ground. So that's what we mean by a conducting rod. These were invented by Benjamin Franklin quite a long time ago. So pause the video, have a crack at explaining this. Why do we have lightning rods on tall buildings? Okay, so now you've had a chance to have a go at answering that. Uh, let's have a look. 
I'm starting my explanation by if there weren't a conductor. So if there wasn't a conductor, uh, so because oh, I've switched slides, it's gone, so let's put it back in. Um, the current would pass through the building causing damage. Because remember, the building is the lowest resistance pathway to ground. So if there's no conductor, Big Ben is very likely to get hit because it's very tall. So that might damage any electrical equipment we have inside it. It might injure any some people we have inside it. So that's not going to be good. Um, most likely outcome is probably it would start a fire um, out of anything that would happen. But anyway, that's semantics. Anyway, so that's why if we didn't have the conductor, we'd get a large amount of damage, injury, fires, that kind of thing. Because the building is the lowest resistance pathway to ground. The conductor, due to its high electron density, provides an even lower resistance pathway to ground because uh, this is metal. So essentially what happens is you get your lightning strike. So let's draw ourselves a lightning strike. Lightning strikes up here. And what happens is uh, instead of our current going through it, our current now goes around the outside. So our, we have a really big current that goes around the outside. We get probably a very, very small current, if anything, going through the building now. And we've protected the things inside the building and it's not going to catch fire, that kind of thing. So again, effectively, what we've now done, if we think about it in circuitry terms, again, we had to go through the air to get here. There's no way of avoiding that. So that's like a theory resistor. Now what we've got is we've got a really chunky resistance going through air. We've got a small resistance going through the building. And effectively, what we've done is connect a wire here. So what you might call this is essentially a short circuit. So essentially, the current is going to skip out the air and the building in this. So hence why we call it a short circuit, because our current's going to go this way.